Good evening and welcome to Doctors On Call. I'm Dr. Heather Mooster, a nephrologist with the University of Minnesota Physicians and educator at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth Campus. I'll be your host for our program tonight on men's health and kidney stones. The success of this program depends on our viewers, so please call in with your questions on men's health concerns or problems with kidney stones and we will do our best to answer them. The telephone numbers for your questions can be found at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists this evening include Dr. Nicholas Johnson, a urologist with St. Luke's Urology Associates, Dr. Benjamin Marsh, a urologist with Essentia Health, and Dr. Paul Sanford, an internal medicine specialist with St. Luke's Internal Medicine Associates. Our medical students answering phones tonight are Ashley Fankhauser of Wirehouse, Wisconsin, Kelsey Hessel from Wausau, Wisconsin, and Matthew Moritz from Sock Center, Minnesota. And now on to tonight's program on men's health and kidney stones. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So one of the most frequent questions I always got in my nephrology clinic was, why do I go to the bathroom so often at night? Dr. Mm -hmm. Marsh, could you answer that for us? That's a great question. Um, we know that, so the te technical term for this is nocturia going to the bathroom at night and the clinical definition is when you go to the bathroom more than two times a night um, but it can be varying degrees up to some people go to the bathroom six to eight times a night um, and the reasons for that vary quite a bit um, for some people it's related to untreated sleep apnea for some people it's heart failure um, some people just make a lot of urine at night. There's a lot of different reasons, um, but it can be a pretty bothersome problem for people when they get older. Dr. Johnson, what do you recommend to your patients to help reduce that frequency? Well, Dr. Marsh talked on a couple different points, and I think uh, the key is to try to sort it out with the patient ahead of time so you have a better idea. So what we utilize in neurology often is a simple voiding diary where you literally write down what you drink, what time you drink it, how much of it, and then you write down how often you pee. And so you have the fun little drill of peeing into a container, measuring it, writing it down, and then bringing that information back so that we can go over it. And just that voiding diary alone helps differentiate what the root cause might be. So I think a lot of people assume that it's always a big prostate that causes them to have to go to the bathroom often, but there's many other causes, correct? And that's what you were alluding to, Dr. Marsh. And Dr. Sanford, you and I would frequently deal with some of those other causes. So some of those could be like swelling of your legs and having too much fluid or right. how and when you take your medications. That's could right. you comment on that for us? You betcha. During the day, our legs are three and a half, four feet below our heart. And then at the end of the day, when we lie down with our salt sodden, you know, puffy legs, that fluid comes into our system just like we drank a goldfish bowl of water. And uh, you end up having to tip a kidney when that happens several times or if your sugars are too high, or if you have incomplete emptying, or if you took your diuretic medication right before bedtime. I always tell people, try not to eat or drink anything within two hours of going to bed at night so you don't have problems with having to urinate and so you don't have problems with heartburn. Exactly right, and so when I would prescribe the water pills, I would most often tell people, don't take them after about four o'clock in the afternoon, otherwise they could keep you up. But I also always aim to make sure that people weren't collecting fluid in their legs. If they had fluid when they went to bed, they were gonna be up at night. And that was just going to create a bigger problem uh, for them. Yep. Now, I think another question that I hear asked often, and I'm gonna start with Dr. Sanford because I think it comes up in the primary care clinic, is do I have to have that prostate test or the PSA test? And why do I need to have that done? Well, pr the PSA test is a way of screening for prostate cancer, which is about the most prevalent cancer in men. And the PSA test is not always 100% you know, predictive, and, but it is one of the many tools. Also important in looking for prostate cancer is asking the questions about how many times a day or night do you have to pee 
can I say that on the air? Um, and, uh, and then the digital rectal exam, making sure it doesn't, your prostate feels smooth and not like a bag of marbles. And Dr. Marsh, it's not just cancer that can cause alterations in that PSA test. Right, and that's where some of the controversy comes in. I think it was in 2012, the U.S. Preventative Task Force Services guidelines recommended not screening with PSA uh, anymore. Um, and that was the result of some long-term studies that showed that there was some questionable benefit uh, to screening. That actually has been reversed, I believe, in the 2018 guidelines. Mm -hmm. So the current guidelines say screening from age 55 to 69, everybody should get it annually. Um, so, but your question was about common reasons for PSA elevation. Um, so one of those reasons is prostate cancer. That's obviously the big one that we want to rule out, but just having an enlarged prostate can cause an elevated PSA, having a urinary tract infection or something called prostatitis, inflammation in the prostate uh, can cause an elevated PSA, not emptying your bladder well. So there's a lot of different reasons um, and we just need to be very cognizant of um, looking at not just the single number, but the trend and, and, uh, and what it's doing over time. Excellent. Well, another topic, I know we're, it's men's health, but you're both uh, urologists. And another thing that urologists and our primary care physicians take care of or see a lot of is when somebody has blood in their urine. And sometimes this is blood that they see when they urinate in the toilet, they'll see a lot of blood. And sometimes it's only blood that you can see under the microscope. Dr. Johnson, can you talk to us about what might be causing that and how you approach trying to figure out why they have that? Sure, uh, I think it's a good uh, starting point to kind of differentiate microscopic hematuria, which is blood in the urine that you can only see under the microscope, as opposed to gross hematuria, which is blood in the urine that you can see in the toilet. Both of them, are encouraged to have good close follow-up with a urologist. Um, but the reality is that the root cause of microscopic hematuria and gross hematuria may be the same thing. So when we talk about a workup, we're talking about the additional diagnostic tests that we use to try to figure out the source of that blood. Uh, the standard is a, a CAT scan, but it could be other forms of imaging followed up by a cystoscope, which was using a small scope to actually look inside the bladder. The causes are many. The most common would be a kidney stone, uh, can be from infection, uh, and more ominously can be from a cancer. And that's why we, even the microscopic hematuria, we do recommend doing that workup. And sometimes that blood doesn't have anything to do with the tubes that connect the kidney to the bladder. Sometimes it's the kidney itself. The kidney itself, that's right. right. So it's possible that even after they've seen you, they may still need to see a kidney specialist as well. Yeah, we, we definitely have cases which can be a little bit harder to sort out. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we go through that whole workup, especially for the microscopic hematuria, and we don't find a smoking gun, so to speak. We don't 100% know what the root cause is. And so part of that workup is just to assure ourselves that we're not missing something more ominous. But if there's anything else in the urine parameters which suggest that the kidney might not be functioning properly, that's often when we'll make a referral to someone like to you. To someone like us. Yeah. And even in, in my clinics, like I told them if they had lots of risk factors, even if they had a kidney disease that I knew would put blood in their urine, if they had lots of risk factors and had not had an evaluation from a urologist like yourself, I requested that they have one because I couldn't determine if they had two problems or just one. Yeah. Now, in relation to that, Dr. Marsh, somebody, uh, Anne, it looks like from Duluth is asking, why are kidney stones so painful? Uh, and indeed they are. Sure. So the, the pain of a kidney stone is often, I think in the medical world, called renal colic. And so the pain comes in when the stone drops down from the kidney into the tube called the ureter that drains urine from the kidney to the bladder. And that's where, that's where all the pain comes in. Once it gets into the bladder, you're home free. Getting it from the bladder out the urethra, no problem. And essentially the pain is, is coming in because the ureter is getting blocked and the ureter wants to push that urine down, down the tube and it's backing up and the pressure is backing up to the kidney 
and the kidney for some reason is just exquisitely sensitive to that pressure and that buildup. Um, so I, I don't exactly know why, but that's just the way it is. And the, and the larger the stone, the more likely they're going to have more pain. I mean, some people, I think, perhaps if it's stuck, right? If, if you have a 10 centimeter stone that's stuck in the ureter, that's maybe different than a one millimeter or tiny little stone that you might pass more easily spontaneously, but both can be painful. Yeah, and actually I think that's, that is kind of a common misconception. I've definitely seen one millimeter stone have patients doubled over and in extreme pain, I've seen one centimeter stone patients not even know they're there. So um, the size of the stone definitely affects how likely it is to pass and how likely it is that we're going to intervene on it surgically potentially. Um, but but the in relation to how much pain they cause, not not as um, it's not as consistently yeah, yes. associated. Right. Stones are painful. Yes. There's now, a, sorry to interrupt. There's, there's another misconception too. Right on cue, these nice little props, but people will look at the pictures on our wall and see a jagged stone and assume right. that's the stone that hurts and the smooth stone doesn't. But as Dr. Marsh was saying, it, it doesn't matter how big it is, it doesn't matter what it's made out of, it doesn't matter what it looks like. If it blocks, it hurts. If it doesn't block, it doesn't hurt. The only yeah. pain response a kidney has is a stretch response from a stretch receptor. So right. it doesn't matter the size just for matters if it blocks. Yeah. Just whether or not it blocks. And then the type of stone does predict uh, what we might have to do to treat it. So that's a further topic. I do have a question here from, uh, from Superior. I'm not sure I can pronounce the name, so I might leave it at that. But he is asking, could a blood pressure pill be a diuretic, Dr. Sanford? Yes. Yeah, there are a lot of different medicines that are used for bringing down blood pressure that are diuretics, most commonly hydrochlorothiazide and to a lesser degree Lasix or ferrosamide, but they're, they, they can function in that purpose for very mild hypertension. Exactly correct. So if we're going to uh, talk about other men's health issues, another one that I think is difficult for people to talk about, but comes up very frequently, is going to be impotence or people who have difficulty with erections and erectile dysfunction. So Dr. Marsh, would you like to start that conversation? How do you approach that with your patients? Sure, and this is, uh, I think, a fairly common issue that I see in uh, my older patients. Um, the first thing that we talk about is often the common causes of erectile dysfunction. Um, the uh, one of the more common ones is actually vascular disease. So patients who are diabetic, high blood pressure, um, things like that. The, the blood vessels that enable us to get erections can sometimes get narrowed. And so oftentimes this can be the first sign of, of patients developing some cardiovascular disease. So that's one thing I always keep in mind. Um, so we'll often look at their medication list. We'll talk about their medical history, things like that. Um, to, to go through the different causes of erectile dysfunction. Um, the other thing that we always discuss then are, of course, the treatment options. Did you want me to get into those as well? I or? think briefly you could sure. comment on the fact that there are a multitude of treatment options right. that range from medication to non-medication options and not one particular thing is going to work for every single patient. Right, so at the end of the day, there's a lot of different causes for erectile dysfunction, but the treatments are all kind of the same almost regardless. There's, as you mentioned, there's pills. These are things like Viagra that everybody's heard about. Mm -hmm. There are injections, and then there are um, uh, actually implantable devices that you can do surgically if none of the aforementioned treatments work. Work. And it's just important that people ask about that, I think. And it usually starts with people like you, uh, Dr. Sanford, because it usually starts probably in the primary care clinic, clinic. But having that conversation and just asking allows us to really figure out how best to help them with that issue. Absolutely. Because medications themselves, in particular high blood pressure medica uh, medications, can cause a problem. And it's important for us to understand that, I think. Absolutely. The blood pressure medicines have that potential. People that have underlying diseases like diabetes and then peripheral vascular and central vascular disease, uh, people with thyroid disorders. Um, you know, there's so many different contributing causes. So we have a few questions. 
Uh, and you're going to see that um, there's all, all kinds of interesting things that uh, people are wondering about. Um, here's someone from Wisconsin, and I, I used to get a question similar to this fairly frequently, and I was never quite sure where it came from. Is it better to get up and go to the bathroom or not? And my response usually was, is, well, if you have to go, you should probably just get up and go. There's no particular value in not going. Unless you're winter camping and it's 20 degrees outside, <laughs> well, below outside your sleeping bag. I suppose that may encourage you to not want to get up and go yeah. to the bathroom. No. Uh, I, I think maybe where that comes from, I'm not, I'm not sure, a little conjecture, but there is kind of a um, physical therapy teaches people with underlying urgency and frequency of urination to sometimes try to ignore that urge. And so perhaps that's where that's coming from. If you can convince yourself that you don't have to go to the bathroom every time you have the urge, you might get a little more rest and time in between. But otherwise, I would say if you have to go to the bathroom, Just go. you should probably go to the bathroom. So we have uh, Clayton from Chisholm who is wondering why our urine develops a strong odor. So, Dr. Johnson, why don't you start? <laughs> <laughs> you were speaking last, we'll go with you. Yeah, uh, Clayton might eat a lot of asparagus, I don't know. Yep. Uh, there, there are a couple of, of uh, base components of urine that tend to give its smell, and it can be diet dependent. That's usually what's going on, especially if there's variation um, day to day. I, don't spend a lot of time smelling my own urine, so I can't <laughs> give you too much insight on that. But, but usually it is diet-based, and it's, it's not unhealthy. It's not an indication that there's something uh, going wrong on a systems basis. So we have a whole bunch of questions uh, now, and this one harkens back to a topic we were talking about before. And Dr. Marsh, I think it's worth exploring a little bit, and this is Greg, and he's asking, why do the current guidelines recommend an annual PSA test, but not for someone over the age of 70? That's a great question. So the thing about prostate cancer, and that makes it difficult to study, is that it's a very slow growing cancer. So on average, when I diagnose a patient with prostate cancer, we know that if we do nothing, it probably won't spread outside of the prostate for 10 years on average. So I wanna make sure that if we're going to go forward with a treatment for prostate cancer, that that person is going to get some benefit from it. And that is to say, if they don't have a life expectancy of at least 10 years, they're not likely going to benefit from a treatment that potentially has side effects to it. So that's where the current guidelines come into play at, at age 70 stopping screening because on average, if you haven't been diagnosed with prostate cancer before that, it's likely not going to affect you in your lifespan. Now that being said, there are, I, I definitely have treated some patients with prostate cancer who are 70, 71, even maybe 72, who are in great shape, you know, run every day, and, and I think that they're likely to live another 15 years, and that this is something that might affect them in their lifespan. So just kind of taking on an individual basis and and choosing wisely is important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Sanford, I'm going to start this question with you, and we're gonna get back up probably from Dr. Johnson, but I, I think a lot of what you treat impacts this question. And Kenneth from Virginia is asking, why does your bladder strength diminish? And he has a follow-up to that is, why might you need a Foley catheter, which is so we move on. But oh, there sure. are a multitude of chronic diseases that can make your bladder not function well. Oh, absolutely. Spinal cord injuries, anything that is supposed to serve the muscle of the bladder, bladder the, the detrusor muscle that squeezes the bladder down and allows you to expel your urine. So mechanical things like obstruction from the prostate uh, and uh, neurologic issues, diabetes and uh, spinal cord injuries, and then some medications can have an effect too. And Dr. Johnson, at what point would you need to consider a Foley catheter for a patient if their bladder was not functioning well? Uh, good question, hard to answer with a, a concrete number. Um, just to uh, expound a little bit on what Dr. Sanford was saying, I, th I think uh, in men uh, who have noticed 
a decline in bladder function over time, there are multiple causes, but a very common cause is bladder outlet obstruction, and that is often from uh, blockage from the prostate itself. And the bladder muscle is just that. It's, it's a muscle, and its job is to come up with a coordinated squeeze. But if that muscle's been pushing against a fixed obstruction for many, many, many years, the muscle is going to first build up and get stronger, but at some point in time, it can't overcome that fixed obstruction, and the muscle itself just stops functioning. And so some people who end up with a Foley catheter, it's because that muscle just failed, literally from pushing against this fixed obstruction. Usually the, the point at which they required a catheter is a little bit nebulous. It's not a, an a exact point in time. Sometimes it's just you can tell because of the pattern the bladder has not been emptying as well as it used to, and at some point the catheter is necessary. But for other men, it's actually an abrupt change. They were urinating decently, and then they couldn't urinate at all. And actually, those men have a much better chance at a long-term recovery than the men who have had a slow buildup to going into urinary retention. And I think it's important to point out that the, the goal of the Foley catheter is to, now, to not allow uh, pressure buildup from retained urine back into the kidney over long periods of time that can cause your kidney to not function well. So we don't yeah. consider Foley's just because you might have some difficulty with expelling all of your urine, but we do worry if you can't get rid of enough urine that you're chronically accumulating urine in that bladder and you're getting back pressure into the kidney because it's all one closed system. Yeah, kidneys are at risk. Uh, you're at higher risk for infection as well because it's a static uh, pool that can uh, harbor bacteria. So there's, there's multiple reasons, but I think Dr. Sanford did a good job of explaining that the, the uh, reasons are multiple. Exactly. Now in the opposite sort of direction, uh, David from Superior is saying, with a prostate cancer history, why can't I hold my urine in and is there a treatment? So now we're talking about somebody who is uh, basically describing incontinence, right? Someone who either uh, is spontaneously losing urine or after attempting to void has sort of ongoing dribbling or some other issues. Dr. Marsh, could you comment? Sure. So. Incontinence in men is actually fairly commonly seen after treatment for prostate cancer. And this is because when you remove the prostate, you're removing a component of that outlet obstruction and that just, um, it, it ends up with men developing something called stress incontinence, so leakage with laughing, coughing, sneezing, things like that. Um, uh, that's, so like I said, that's one of the side effects of treatment of prostate cancer. Um, in, in somebody who has not undergone treatment for prostate cancer, um, it's a little more difficult to speculate why they might be having urinary incontinence. It could just be because the, the prostate is, is enlarged and that's caused effects of the bladder, um, caused to become overactive. It, it's a little bit hard to say. But. So Dr. Sanford, Kevin in Duluth wants to know what causes kidney stones. Oh boy. Well, if you're not drinking enough water to dilute mm -hmm. the no. calcium oxalate or the uric acid that makes stones, that could do it. If you're eating too many cheeseburgers, <laughs> that could do it. Um, I think that uh, genetics plays a role, how much our kidneys excrete of these chemicals. There are a host of different things, but the bottom line is to prevent them, drink your water. And some medications put you at risk for kidney stones oh, yes. as well. So you, you may not have them until you go on some medications. And it's also associated with diabetes and mm -hmm. people who have had bypass surgery, gastric bypass surgery puts yep. them at risk for that as well. So oh. there's some other uh, basics, but that's why we need to take our history after you've had a stone, sometimes do our 24 hour urine collections to get a metabolic workup and start to understand what we can do to actually prevent you from having another one. So Amen. you don't have to finish and go back to the urologist because we really love what you do, <laughs> but not everybody really uh, is thrilled at having to see you with a kidney stone. That's not a happy day for them usually. <laughs> so uh, no name here, but someone is asking, what is interstitial cystitis and how is it diagnosed? That's my literal question. 
So Dr. Johnson or Dr. Marsh, would you like to? Uh, um, <coughs> Dr. Marsh uh, just uh, passed his boards more recently <laughs> than I did. So. <laughs> No, uh, sure. The interstitial cystitis is, I, I hate to use this term, but it, it's a little bit of what we call like a garbage term. Not that it's not a real diagnosis, uh, but there are so many different factors in bladder symptoms that had traditionally been called interstitial cystitis. So in the last few years as an um, organization, the, the uh, AUA has helped to define criteria for interstitial cystitis. Um, not everyone with bladder symptoms has interstitial cystitis. The hallmark is you have to have pain with urination. Um, you can have blood in your urine, but you don't have to. But also when you look inside the bladder with the scope, there are some hallmark features. Um, and so a lot of people carry the diagnosis, but they may not have actual interstitial cystitis. Thank you. Well, I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Nicholas Johnson, Dr. Benjamin Marsh, and Dr. Paul Sanford, and our medical student phone volunteers, Ashley, Kelsey, and Matthew. Please join Dr. Paula Termulin next week for a program on cancer diagnosis, treatment, and survivorship, when her panelists will be Dr. Jeff Coatman, Dr. Lloyd Ketchum, and Dr. Sandy Stover. Thank you for watching, and have a great evening.